Okay, hello everybody. Uh, the title of our presentation is The State of the Art on Knowledge Graph Construction from Text. On this theme, we specifically pick on named entity recognition and relation extraction perspectives. The presentation is by me, uh, Jennifer D'Souza, and my colleague Nandana Mehinda Surya. So I will be presenting uh, named entity recognition technologies, while my colleague Nandana will present relation extraction technologies. So a little bit about us. I am Jennifer. I work as a postdoctoral researcher, uh, and I lead the development of NLP technologies for the Open Research Knowledge Graph Project at TIB in Hanover, Germany. Uh, I'm Nandana Mehidukulasuri. I work at IBM Research AI as a research scientist, and I'm currently at the Dublin Research Lab, and I am uh, leading some knowledge induction work at uh, IBM. Thank you. And then with that, I will begin with part one of our joint presentation, the named entity recognition perspective, uh, uh, reflecting on the state of the art on knowledge graph construction from text. So named entity recognition, NER, uh, is the process of finding entities which involve people, cities, organizations, states in a text. So basically, given a sentence, we want to find the named entities, and then we want to classify those named entities into certain predefined types. Uh, this classification task can be done at different levels of granularities of entity types. So location could be further classified as fine grained types, city and state. All right, so this task is challenging because there exist variations of named entities. So John Smith can be written as Mr. Smith or just John. So NER has to identify variations of entities. Um, furthermore, there is an ambiguity of named entity type. So is John Smith a company or is it a person? Is May a person or a month? Therefore, uh, NER technologies are required to be able to handle these, this ambiguity of any types. Finally, there are common words that are used in natural language, and uh, this poses again further an ambiguity problem for uh, NER. Okay, so the plan for part one of the talk is, first of all, to present the various annotated corpora that exist for the NER task. Then we will look at uh, machine learning approaches, which have primarily been neural approaches since 2011. Uh, then we will look at how well these approaches perform and which are the state of the art uh, neural architectures. And I will conclude with a set of applications of uh, uh, NER systems. So starting with corpora. Uh, so in the 90s, originally, uh, the MUC series was organized and financed by DARPA to encourage the development of new and better methods of information extraction. Therefore, this shared task series involved also introducing some of the more prominent um, uh, evaluation measures that are in use today, such as precision and recall. So in the MUC series, which was one of the first corpora introduced uh, for NER, uh, it focused on annotating the entity types percent, money, time, date, person, location, and organization on articles in the Newswire domain. Following MUC, uh, ACE was a follow-up uh, shared task series. Uh, indeed, the corpus itself was also called the ACE uh, corpus. Uh, basically, it extended the MUC uh, with additional named entity types, as you can see, facility, weapon, vehicle, and geopolitical entities. And um, also an expanded genre of text was covered here. So it went beyond Newswire to web logs, uh, bulletin boards, transcripts of broadcast news, and so on and so forth. And furthermore, it covered uh, three different languages, Arabic, English, and Chinese. Um, all right, so around the same time, uh, the Connell shared task series came into uh, four, which began in 2022, 2002. Um, and the focus here was on language independent name entity recognition. So we start seeing uh, a corpora being developed on languages other than English. 
So uh, the Connell Corpus focused only on four entity types, person, organization, location, and miscellaneous. The genre of text was uh, news via articles. And in the uh, 2002 task, it uh, introduced Corpora for Dutch and Spanish languages. And in 2003, it introduced Corpora for German and English. Uh, then moving on, in 2013 um, came the Entronauts Corpus. Uh, this is one of the uh, largest corpus available to date uh, with, um, uh, with, um, with a, a high quality of human annotation uh, for the named entity types, also involving um, 18 more types, so extending the entity type coverage uh, beyond what was um, seen before. So. Um, and furthermore, uh, the genre of text uh, basically uh, was similar somehow to the Connell uh, corpus, uh, and it annotated corpora for English, Arabic, and Chinese languages. And we see a shift in focus from newswire focused corpora to encyclopedia based corpora, basically uh, annotating Wikipedia articles with named entity types. Now, here, one of the benefits of doing this was that uh, the link structures within Wikipedia articles were then used as uh, semi supervised signals to annotate entity types, and therefore the coverage of entity types um, expanded greatly, as we will see um, in the eventual slides. All right, so um, the first corpus that came out here was in 2009. It was called the Wikigold Corpus. Uh, all right, this uh, corpus, again, uh, focused on just the Connell types, so just four entities. Uh, nevertheless, it still used a Wikipedia link structure to automatically generate the entity annotations. Uh, next came the Wiki Figure Corpus, which curated a set of 112 unique tags. So now we see a great expansion on the entity types um, uh, on the Wikipedia NER corpora. So uh, basically, um, uh, uh, it basically introduced fine grained types for each of the coarse grained entity types that we saw in the Connell Corpus. So, person, for instance, include annotations for actor, architect, artist, athlete, and so on. Next came the Wiki NER corpus. Now this corpus created an enormous multilingual silver standard uh, uh, annotated corpus. So it covered various languages, including Dutch, English, French, German, Italian, and so on and so forth. Then came the Wiki ANN corpus. So it extended multilinguality from Wiki NER's nine languages to almost all the languages in Wikipedia, which was roughly 282. Uh, then the winner corpus extended coverage of named entity mentions with the help of co-reference resolution. So this was an added component of uh, NLP technologies to increase uh, the coverage of uh, named entities that were recognized. Then came the Vexia corpus, which created a large annotated corpus based on Wikipedia containing millions of annotations, again incorporating co-reference uh, signals. Um, all right. And then uh, came the Wiki Neural Corpus, which was back just in 2021, which combines neural and knowledge-based methods for silver data creation for multilingual NER. And specifically, it uh, leverages this uh, tool, BabelNet, synsets as fine-grained entity types to generate multilingual annotated data sets. Okay, so then now again, we see a shift in focus on the corpora uh, domain to uh, the social media domain and um, uh, a corpora that were introduced uh, uh, targeting the social media domain involved mainly tweets. Uh, so Twitter was leveraged as the data source. Uh, so the first uh, corpora introduced in this regard was Twitter NER. It contains annotations for 2,400 tweets with 10 types, which are both popular on Twitter and have a good coverage in free base. So now we are seeing new types emerging, such as sports team, movie, band, et cetera, which you uh, might note is, um, you know, are commonly used in, in tweets as opposed to uh, um, newswire. Corpus. All right, so WNUT was um, a shared task. Uh, so it's basically called the workshop on noisy user generated 
Index. So these uh, shared tasks basically leveraged the Twitter NER corpus and extended it a little bit with additional test data set uh, annotations. And then in 2017, the WNUT, um, uh, a version of the shared task, maintained a specific focus on rare and emerging uh, entities. All right. Um, there are other corpora as well, so domains. So, so now we are starting to look at uh, the biomedical domain. So this is basically uh, scholarly publications annotated with uh, entity types that are pertinent to that particular domain. So if we say biomedicine, uh, the junior corpus, uh, which is one of the main corpora uh, in the genre of text, includes annotations for genes, proteins, and other corpus in the junior ontology. Uh, furthermore, the BioNLP shared class series, which was organized over uh, a sequence of years, um, includes annotations for genes, proteins, bacteria, uh, drugs, and so on. And then we see the BioCreative Shared Task Series, which is basically uh, interlinking the biomedical and the biochemical domains, um, providing annotations for genes, proteins, chemicals, medications, etc. Uh, and then we see again a shift in focus uh, from um, biomedicine to a scholarly domain-specific NER generally. So this is now uh, annotating named entities to analyze uh, trends in um, uh, the kinds of technologies that are being produced in, in research. So um, basically on this slide, you see a table of the various corpora that exist. And as you can see, the domain of the corpus um, uh, uh, varies. Um, uh, across the corpora. So CL stands for computational linguistics, uh, CS stands for computer science, MS, uh, material science, and PHY for physics, and so on. Uh, the STEM ECR corpus, which was a corpora uh, emerging from our research group, is, the, um, is a largely uh, multidisciplinary corpus, and to our knowledge has the uh, widest coverage of, of uh, disciplines. So it includes uh, annotations uh, on abstracts for 10 uh, STEM uh, disciplines. And of course, each of these corpora differ on uh, the semantic entity types as well that were annotated. Um, all right, so um, this concludes uh, the corpora section of my talk. Uh, so now let's look at some approaches for automatic NER. Given these corpora, uh, we now want to transition to training machine learning systems uh, so that given a new piece of text, uh, either a tweet or a Wikipedia article, the approach is supposed to uh, automatically give us uh, the named entity types uh, from this data. So um, early approaches to named entity recognitions were based on gazetteer lists. Uh, so of course, um, advantage is that it's simple, fast, language independent, etc. But the disadvantage is the maintenance of the list is uh, a human um, intensive uh, effort. And so um, that uh, takes a lot of time. It cannot deal with name variants and so on. Uh, so um, gather to your list. Uh, so then the approaches went one step further to grammar and shallow parsing techniques. So a regular Regular expressions were then defined as patterns to identify named entities automatically from text. So indeed, uh, the named entity itself was offered as a placeholder within the regular expression. So then the regular expression when passed through text extracted all the um, entities that satisfied uh, that pattern. So for example, to the compass is a placeholder of cat word, which is a placeholder. So that would um, then match uh, to the south of Timbuktu. Again, there are difficulties here because um, capitalized, the first word of a sentence is ambiguously capitalized, so it cannot handle that. Uh, neither could it handle semantic ambiguity and so on. So starting with Colabera et al. in 2011, neural network NER systems with minimal feature engineering have become uh, popular. So um, Colabera et al. proposed uh, a word-level neural network model. So this architecture basically involved uh, offering words of a sentence as input to a convolutional neural network, and each word was represented by its word embedding. 
So uh, Huang et al. in 2015 uh, proposed a different architecture for a word-level neural network. Basically, the convolutional neural network component was replaced by a recurrent neural network component. Um, and furthermore, uh, a conditional random field layer was added to the top of the recurrent uh, RNN, uh, which further improved performance on the NER task. Next, uh, we see a change in the neural network architecture focus. So from word level, we now move to character level neural network models. Uh, such models are especially beneficial for languages such as Chinese and Japanese, which do not involve uh, uh, regular spacing uh, uh, between words uh, as in English and other. Germanic languages. So here a sentence is taken to be a sequence of characters, and this sequence is passed through an RNN predicting labels for each character. All right, so um, furthermore, Kim et al. in 2016 proposed uh, uh, focused on a character level neural network, but proposed a different architecture uh, that advanced one step further what went before. Um, Next, we see researchers uh, combining both word and character signals within a single neural network architecture. So the first type of a model here represented words as combination of a word embedding and convolution over the characters of the word and follows this with a bile STM layer over the word representations of a sentence and finally uses a softmax or a CRF layer to generate labels. The second type of model uh, concatenates word embeddings with LSTMs over characters of the word and passes this representation through another sentence level by LSTM and predicts the final tags using a CRF layer. All right, so then we see a further advancement in um, uh, neural um, architectures where now uh, a system was proposed that combined character, word, and affix signals um, uh, within a single neural network architecture to improve uh, the NER uh, task. So let's look at now uh, how these systems perform. So first of all, how is a system, uh, uh, how is a performance of an NER system evaluated? Well, based on the standard method of methodology that was introduced in the MUC series in the early 90s using the recall precision and F measure formula, where recall tells us how much relevant information the system has extracted. Precision tells us how much of the information the system returned is correct. Um, so every algorithm's output is compared against a goal standard, where the goal standard comes from the annotated corpora, which we have seen before. That's the ideal output. And basically, you try to find the difference between the two. So explorative algorithms try to extract everything they find. So therefore, their recall is great and precision is bad. And these are two flavors of algorithms that people often propose. And conservative algorithms, which are commonly used in the medical domain, extract only things about which they are very certain. So here, the precision is great, but the recall is not so good. OK, so then we come to the F measure, uh, which uh, uh, folks often use to, um, uh, to uh, fine tune the performance of their system. So F measure is basically a trade off between precision and recall. Um, all right, so now we come to uh, some concrete results. Uh, and basically, we will be looking at the evaluation of various systems over time on the Connell 2003 data set uh, over uh, extracting the person, organization, location, and miscellaneous named entities. Um, on, and basically, uh, yes, the Connell uh, uh, shared task series introduced multilingual corpora, so we can look at their performances on various languages as well, Spanish, Dutch, English, and German, to be specific. So. Uh, the early feature engineered systems uh, offered a very high performance already, but note uh, the, uh, the, it's a human intensive endeavor. So the human is required to uh, engineer the features that the machine learning system is then supposed to pick up on. But then we move on to neural models where uh, no human engineering of features is involved. So basically, the neural network itself infers all the important features, and we see that performances were close uh, to a feature engineered uh, system. Uh, and next, with uh, certain advanced models, that is the word and character neural architecture, performances even surpassed uh, human feature engineered uh, approaches. And then um, we see that um, the word 
character and affix model, while it didn't uh, offer uh, higher performances on English, it was relatively high again, but not as high as the feature engineered system, nevertheless offered higher performances on other languages. So this basically tells us then when designing a neural network architecture, uh, the architecture itself can be configured to suit the underlying uh, language to obtain uh, optimal performances. All right, so uh, for on other data sets, a recommended resource, of course, is papersworkcode.com, where you can see various uh, evaluations over time. And finally, applications. So um, low-level information extraction tasks, such as extracting event cards from emails, um, is uh, one part of, uh, is an application of named entity recognition. Again, search engines rely on, uh, heavily rely on NER technologies. Um, and there are other application domains as question answering, machine translation, information retrieval, text summarization, text understanding, and entity linking, uh, which goes to say that NER forms the basic component of uh, various high-level NLP uh, uh, applications. So now I will transfer to my colleague uh, Nandana for the second part of the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. So Jennifer talked about name entity uh, ex uh, extraction. I will, in the second part, I will talk about relation extraction. So uh, given a sentence like uh, Irene Morgan, who was born and raised in Baltimore and lived in Long Island, uh, as we already saw name entity recognition identifies the entities and their types uh, in text. Uh, and now, when this is done, another interesting task is to see if we can identify relations between these entities mentioned in the text. For example, uh, in the text, we can see Irene Morgan was born in Baltimore, and we can align it to a predefined relation city of birth, uh, uh, if, and then that will provide more information. Uh, so this task uh, can be uh, related to several uh, existing uh, academic tasks. Um, one task of such one such task is open information extraction. In 2017, Banco argued that having a small number of predefined relations is quite limiting, and it's better to automatically discover relations from text. So, in open information extraction, the relations are directly derived from text rather than depending on a set of relations coming from an ontology. However, in this case, if we want to use these relations to build a knowledge graph with an ontology, we will have to perform clustering, canonicalization, and linking to ontologies some additional tasks. Similarly, uh, another task is slot filling. So here, the task is given a subject and a relation. We are trying to find the correct value or the object for that relation. So as you can see, this is the same goal, but with a different setting. Uh, now let's look at some of the examples from relation extraction benchmarks to understand the task a little bit better. So this is some example from the Tuckred uh, academic benchmark. In this task, a sentence with a head and tail entities are given, and the task is to identify what is the correct relation that applies for those two uh, entities. For example, in the first sentence, uh, we can see Kathleen and Chairwoman as the two entities. And then the task is to identify that the relation between them is the title. Uh, it is important to note that uh, this is a special case that we are expected to identify cases where there's no relation between the two entities. For example, in this slide, if you look at the last uh, sentence uh, between uh, Baldwin and Executive, we can see that there's no relations and the, the, the task uh, also uh, means that you have to identify such cases where there's no relations between two entities. And moving on, uh, there could be like different types of uh, relations. Uh, for example, in this uh, Semival 2000 task, they provided nine different relations to identify such as cause effect, product producer, et cetera. The task is similar to the previous examples that we have shown. But in this case, relation types are quite different, as you can see. Uh, for example, in the example in the left, uh, we can see there's a relation between the earthquake and aftershocks that is cause effect. Uh, also, as you can see, these relations are not symmetrical. So it's ordered, it's important to identify the, the head and tail entity as well, because if you switch the head and tail, 
the same relation will not uh, ap uh, apply. And uh, similarly, another dimension of relation extraction is that you only, uh, if you want, only want to identify relations within a single sentence, or if we want to identify long distance relations within a document that can span across multiple sentences. In this example, you can see there is a relation, educated at uh, relation between Tillery and University of Michigan, but it's coming from two sentences. So this is exactly what this uh, dark red uh, benchmark is handling uh, this dimension and it tests the ability to identify such relations in a document that spans across multiple sentences. And here are some other examples uh, of uh, such relations that spans across multiple sentences in a single document. And um, once the entities and relations are extracted from a large corpus of text, we can use that to build a knowledge graph by putting them all together so the entities will be uh, the nodes of the graph and then the relations be between them will be the edges. Uh, for example, here we can see some sentences talking about the royal family of Britain. And if we extract the relations between them and put them all together, we can get a knowledge graph as we can see on the right hand side. However, uh, typically this not only involved uh, entity name, entity recognition and relation extraction. Sometimes we have to do some additional tasks. So tasks like entity clustering and canonicalization, entity resolution, entity linking, schema matching, relation linking. So these are some additional tasks that might be involved going from uh, entity name, entity recognition and relation extraction into a fully fledged knowledge graph. We will not cover all this in this talk uh, for the limited scope, but it, it's interesting to know that there are other additional tasks involved uh, in this. So here are a few examples, uh, uh, benchmarks uh, like Jennifer mentioned for name entity recognition. I will not go into each of these in detail, but let me just point out that in recent years, say from 2017, we are seeing an increasing number of benchmarks. It shows that there's a growing interest in this area of relation extraction. And then also the current approaches are actually solving the previous uh, benchmarks pretty well. So we need uh, uh, more challenging benchmarks. Just to uh, take uh, one quick look at this benchmark, one, one of the ways to make this task of relation uh, extraction challenging is to increase the number of relations. In this chart, we have the time as x-axis and the number of relations as y-axis. Uh, as you can see, in early 2000s, we had benchmarks with uh, three or five distinct relations, but now we have benchmarks with more than 1,000 relations. As you can imagine, the current approaches have improved a lot to identify a large number of relations with a reasonable accuracy. Uh, previously, we talked about more open domain uh, relation extraction, but relation extraction can be quite different in some specific domains, for example, in medical documents. So we have domain-specific benchmarks as well. Here you can see some benchmarks for the medical domain. Again, as you can see, uh, we can see an increase in the recent years. After looking at the benchmarks, now let's look at the approaches. There are several branches of work in relation extraction over the time which we will mention here. So the early work on relation extraction was more focused on pattern and rule-based approaches. However, it was not easy to create these rules for a large number of relations, and it was a very hu human uh, effort intensive. So we moved to supervised approaches, including feature-based met methods, kernel models, and neural approaches. However, one of the challenges here was finding good uh, training data. To address this uh, issue of uh, training data, set of distantly supervised approaches were proposed. So the aim of these uh, approaches is to create the training data automatically without a lot of human effort. Also, it was noticed that it was beneficial to do name entity recognition and uh, relation extraction in a joint manner because these two tasks are very tightly related. Uh, and in more, most recent years, we have seen relation extraction using generative models. It's getting very popular. We will look at an example later. Here you can see an example of early linguistic pattern-based approaches for identifying relations. In this example, you see that relation headquarters. As you can see, it's brittle and finding all different linguistic variations of how relationship is written is almost impossible. To make it a bit more generic, 
uh, later approaches used uh, a more uh, higher representations, such as dependency trees, to identify relations. Still, defining rules on top of these dependency trees is still a tedious task. So now moving on to recent work, uh, most NLP tasks got a big boost from introduction of deep neural networks based on transformer architectures. Uh, relation extraction is no exception. In 2019, Soares and others showed that relation extraction can be done by training neural networks to encode both relations and entities in text, uh, and then finding similarity between those representations to identify relations. They have shown that this approach can scale to a large number of relations. Uh, even more recently, the state-of-the-art relation extraction models are using sequence-to-sequence -sequence models such as PART or DeFi for this task. Here, a model is trained to generate the subject, object, and their relations token by token using an encoder-decoder system. So the idea is to give a sentence or a passage as input to train a model that will generate all its relation similar to translating a sentence to a set of relations. In most benchmarks in relation extraction, we are seeing that generative approaches are outperforming the others that we have mentioned. Uh, similar to what uh, Jennifer showed, uh, this is uh, the relation extraction benchmarks in uh, papers with code. And as you can see, the performance has uh, improved significantly from uh, like uh, low 50s to 90s uh, during last uh, 10 years. So I highly recommend you to go and check out uh, papers with this code for relation extraction for more information. Uh, so that's it from my side. So thank you all for your attention. And please refer to these references for more details.